I see you. Yeah. I see you in the back there. Yeah. Yeah, I see you too. I see you guys online. I see you. Yeah. How many of y'all know what these are? Yeah. How many of y'all have ever used a pair of these? In church? Mm -mm. Never in church, probably. They're helpful, though. What do these help you do? They help you see. You know, when I was young, I didn't really need a pair. Um, but I've noticed as I've gotten older, they sure are handy. Like when I was young, I could go to a stadium, sit up on the top, because that's the only place you can afford to sit when you're young. And I could actually see what was happening. Now, if I'm going to be sitting on the top, I don't even go, because I have to look through a pair of these to even see what's happening. These are uh, 10 by 40 tubes, if that tells you anything. I like some Zoom on my binoculars. <laughs> binoculars do a lot of things. They help you see, but they, they, they help you see things clearly. They take things that, for me, are fuzzy, and it makes them clear. It's got this little knob right here. I can just focus it in. It also takes things that are far away and brings them close, makes it easier to see. It also takes um, a, a field of vision or a field of view like we have here this morning, and it, it limits the distractions because it makes you, it forces you to focus in. When I look through these, I can't see all of you. I can just see about 15 of you, right? Because it, it, it brings the focus down. It helps you to see. It takes away your distractions. We've all used binoculars at some point in time in our life, I would estimate. You all know what they are. They're used by lots of people for lots of different reasons, but everybody who uses them uses them for the same reason. They use them so they can see. Today, I want to talk to you about seeing but not seeing physically, not seeing each other, not just noticing that we're here in the room together. I want to talk to you about actually seeing people the way God sees people. Seeing people the way Jesus sees people. And, and I hate to say it, but binoculars aren't going to help you do that. You've got to zoom in even more than a pair of binoculars can to really see people through the eyes of God. To see people through the eyes of Christ. To see people the way God would have us to see people, we have to be able to zoom in to their lives. We have to be able to put all the other distractions of our life away so we can actually see people for who they are. Specifically today, I actually want to talk to you specifically today about the obstacles in your life and in my life, and I include myself in this, in your life and my life, the obstacles that get in our way of seeing people the way God wants us to see people. We're starting a new series called One at a Time. And uh, if you're in small groups, we're doing a small group study called One at a Time by Kyle Eidelman. And uh, it's a great study. It's going to be a great time. We're going to be doing stuff on Sunday that parallels that just as today does. Because I, I want you to think and think about all week what that topic is and what we're talking about. And this week we're talking about seeing. Zooming in and seeing people for who they are and what God has created them to be. People have always wanted to see better. They've always wanted to use uh, magnifiers, if you will. R recently, uh, not too long ago, I took a group to Greece. And we went and we did the footsteps of Paul uh, through Greece. It was great. We went to all these places that Paul was and churches that Paul planted. And near the end of the trip, we ended up on the island of Crete. How many of y'all have heard of Crete? It's in the Bible. Okay, the rest of you should read your Bible. Um, <laughs> We ended up on the island of Crete, and, and really from a biblical significance, there's biblical significance there, but there's not a lot left that you can see today that was there when Paul was there, but we went to this museum, and I'm being honest with you when I tell you this, and I've been to quite a few museums, I like museums, 
It was one of the coolest museums I've ever been to in my life. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. Everything in this museum was, was found or discovered on the island of Crete. It wasn't stuff they would brought in from other places and put on display. Everything in there was found on the island of Crete, and there was so much stuff. And one of the coolest things, we were about halfway through the tour, and we came to this case, and uh, I took a picture of it. We'll throw it up on the, the screen for you here. We, we came across these magnifying lenses, they're there inside that red box. Those are magnifying glasses, magnifying lenses. And they dated these back to between 4,500 and 5,000 years before Christ. People were making magnifying lenses thousands of years, B.C., right? And near where these magnifying glasses were found, they found jewelry, and, and it was this small jewelry, um, not earrings like we would think of them, but, but small things like that, small little pendants like we might think of on a necklace. And, and this jewelry, when you looked at it really, really close, it, and it was so fine, I couldn't even get a picture of it through the glass and the glare and everything that comes with that. But if you looked really, really close, you could see these small little gems and even gold and silver. Some of the gold and silver in these things was as small as a grain of sand. And it had been expertly placed in these tiny little pieces of jewelry to make these beautiful mosaics. And what they believed was is that these magnifying lenses were used to make that jewelry, among other things. They even found some of these magnifying lenses that they had been created so they could be stacked on top of one another to magnify even more onto stuff. I tell you all of that only because I, I want you to see that as humans, we've always wanted to magnify things. We've wanted to be able to see better. We've for a very, very, very long time seen the value in being able to zoom in and see clearly. The title of this sermon series, the title of our small group study is One at a Time, and that's really what we're trying to do is see how Jesus took the time to deal with people one at a time, and how we need to see people the way Jesus saw people, and God sees people, and take the time to deal with people one at a time. Most of the time when we think of Jesus, we think of him doing these big things, feeding 5,000 people, uh, being in the temple in Jerusalem, surrounded by people, right? We think about the passion where he's surrounded by these large groups of people. But when you read through the Gospels so many times, you know what you see Jesus doing? Ministering to people one at a time. Talking to people one at a time. Healing people one at a time. Doing the work of God on people's lives one at a time. In our world, in our culture today that's dominated so much by social media, everybody wants followers and likes. We think that the biggest way to make the biggest difference, or the fastest way to make the biggest difference, is to do it with the masses. But really what God's word teaches us is if you want to make an impact, if you want to make a difference on the world, the way that you do that is one at a time. That's the way Jesus did it. It's really the way the Apostle Paul did it. It's the way Peter did it. It's the way so many have done it over the years. We think of these guys as being world changers because they were, but they changed the world one at a time. And if you and I are going to be like them, if, if we are going to live like Jesus, and if we are going to love like Jesus, and if we are going to lead like Jesus, then we have to learn to see like Jesus. Our passage today comes from Luke chapter 8. If you've got your Bibles, uh, I hope you've opened there already. I'm going to start reading in verse 40. It's a pretty long passage, and then we're going to come back. And what I want you to see is I want you to see that the obstacles you face and I face to dealing with people one at a time, I want you to see that Jesus faced them too. We've dealt with this text before. Uh, there's so much we could talk about in this text, but we're really today just going to be looking at these obstacles that have the potential to get in our way of making a difference and impacting people's lives one at a time. Here's what it says, starting in verse 40. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. 
Just then, a man named Jairus came. He was the leader of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet. He pleaded with him to come to his house because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him, and a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all that she had on doctors yet could not be healed by any approached from behind, and she touched the edge of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming in on you and pressing against you. Someone did touch me, Jesus said. I know that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. Daughter, he said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. There are three huge obstacles that Jesus faces here, and I believe they're the three biggest obstacles in our life when it comes to seeing people, zooming in and making a difference one at a time. The big idea for today has two parts. The first part is a proclamation. The second part is a plea or a prayer. The proclamation is this, Jesus saw, that's the first blank on your bulletin, Jesus saw, that's a proclamation, it's a reality that we can't deny, he saw, he saw this man and he saw this woman. We know that Jesus had the ability to see because he sees people all through the gospels. There's no denying that Jesus saw, that's the proclamation, here's the prayer or the plea for us, help me to see. We have to pray that prayer. We have to ask for God's divine help if we want to see people the way he saw people and still to this day sees people. God still sees you. He still sees me. He still sees us. And he doesn't see us as a, an audience. He doesn't see us as a crowd. He doesn't see us as a, a mass of humanity. He sees us as individual people. He sees us one at a time. Still to this day. But our prayer and our plea has to be, Lord, help me to see. Help me to see like Jesus saw. So why do we fail at this? Why, why don't we really, why, why are we not able to see as Jesus saw? The three big obstacles we have. The first one is what I call experiences. Experiences. And mainly, there are past experiences, and mainly they're bad experiences with people. Anybody here ever had a bad experience with somebody? Okay. All of us. We've all had a bad experience with somebody at some point in our life. And in our passage today, Jesus encounters these two people. And they're two very different people. They're two individual people. In fact, they couldn't be more different. I mean, on the surface, we see, for example, that one is a man and one is a woman. That's different, isn't it? That this is yes, this is no. <laughs> That's different, right? Okay? I'm not asking you what the culture is telling you about that. I'm, I'm asking you what the truth is. There's a difference between a man and a woman. Okay? But that's not it. I mean, one of them is rich and one of them is poor. One of them is a respected leader. The other is an outcast of society. One of them comes to Jesus openly and in public. The other attempts to slip in unnoticed from behind, and to just simply reach out and touch the edge of his cloak, hoping to slip back into the crowd and never be seen. One is bold. The other is humble and unassuming. One has power. The other has absolutely none. I mean, this man and this woman couldn't be more different, but neither of them have any other option than Jesus. They both find themselves in a position where Jesus is their only option. 
And what's amazing to me is that Jesus treats them both the exact same. He sees them. He sees them for who they are. He sees them where they are. And he loves them exactly how they are. We have Jairus, the leader of a synagogue in Capernaum, whose daughter is dying. And we have a woman who needs a physical healing. As far as we know, Jesus didn't have any past experience with this woman. But Jairus, well, that's another story. The King James Version of this text in verse 41 says this. It says, And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And I like that version. I like the way they say that. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. Because in the Greek, in the text, there's something that's hard to capture in the English. But there's a word there that indicates to us that this is a surprise. Everybody is surprised that Jairus has come to Jesus. This wasn't something people expected. It wasn't something people saw coming. It caught everybody off guard. Behold, there came a man named Jairus. Nobody thought he was going to show up on this day because Jairus was a leader of the synagogue. He was a part of the religious establishment. That from beginning to end, they're working against Jesus. I mean, they're very anti-Jesus. If you will, turn back a couple of pages with me to Luke chapter 4. And in Luke chapter 4, we don't see Jairus named. We can't be certain Jairus is here, but there's a lot of stuff that happens in the synagogue where he's the leader. Luke 4.31, it says, Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. This is in the synagogue. For those of you who've traveled to the Holy Land with me, we've stood there in the synagogue. But he does more than just teach on this day. He actually heals a man. He casts a demon out of a man on this day in church too. That, that would have been something Jarius would have took notice of. Would have been something everybody would have been talking about. Can we agree? And it's highly likely that Jarius is there. I mean, it's most probable that he was there. But even if Jarius wasn't there, maybe he was on vacation. Maybe he was speaking in another synagogue. Maybe he was sick that day and didn't come to church. But even if Jarius wasn't there, it is impossible to imagine a scenario where he didn't hear about this. This Jesus who came into church, taught, and then cast a demon out of a guy. That would have made the news. But more happened. I mean, after church, they went to Luby's and everything just like normal. I'm kidding. After church, Jesus... He went out of the synagogue, and for those of you who've been there, you know, you come out of the synagogue, you walk down the street, not very far, and there's Peter's house. And Jesus took that path. He left the synagogue, he went to Peter's house, and then it says this in verse 38, after he left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. So he stood over her, and he rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she got up immediately and began to serve them. Again, something that would have been big news in the small town of Capernaum. But Jesus isn't done yet. If you go to verse 40, same day, it says this. When the sun was setting, so the Sabbath is ending, people are now allowed to carry people and bring people to Jesus. All those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. And look at this. As he laid his hands on each one of them, he healed them. Notice he laid his hands on each one of them, one at a time, healing them. Although this text is not our focus for today, it shows us the love of Christ in this one at a time way. In my book, Signs and Wonders, The Miracles of God, I actually talk about this specific miracle. And the point I draw out in the book, in that study about this is, man, Jesus has had a long day. He was at church. He's got these synagogue leaders who are against him. He heals somebody there. He goes and he heals Peter's mom, mother-in-law, and they're, they're, you know, he's got all that going on. And then all of a sudden the sun's going down. About the time you think, well, okay, I can kick back, watch some football, just enjoy the rest of the evening. People start showing up with all their needs. 
with all their problems. And Jesus, he could have gone out and he could have done this, and I would have if, if it would have been me. I mean, this would have been so tempting, right? He could have just gone out and said, hey, 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 hey. everybody look at me. All right, close your eyes. <laughs> You're healed. Go home. Peace be with you. Y'all have a great life. And he could have come in and just got back to his business. He could have done a mass healing. But he doesn't. He laid his hands on each one of them and he healed them. One at a time. But despite doing all of these things on this day and many more in Capernaum, Jesus didn't get a real warm reception from the religious establishment and the religious leaders of Capernaum, the people like Jairus, who was a leader there at the synagogue. We don't know for certain, but Jesus might have even had a, a run-in with Jairus himself. At the very least, we know that Jairus' friends didn't like Jesus at all. Later in Luke's gospel, Jesus actually curses Capernaum. In Luke chapter 10, verse 15, he says, And you, Capernaum, will be exalted to heaven? No. He says, you will go down to Hades. You see, this was the regional hub of religious power throughout the course of Jesus' ministry. And it was Jesus' hub for ministry in the Galilee area as well, Capernaum. And Jesus knew that this place, specifically this synagogue and these leaders, were very anti-Jesus. They had not made a secret about that. They hassled him and harassed him all through his ministry. So you can see why it would say, Behold, there came a man named Jairus, and we were all surprised about it. You, you can see how it would be surprising that Jairus shows up and asks Jesus for help. But you see, Jairus isn't here on this day as the leader of the synagogue. He's here on this day as a desperate daddy looking for help for his little girl. And Jesus doesn't see him as the leader of the synagogue. He sees him as a desperate daddy looking for help for his little girl. I don't know about you, but I would imagine you're not much, that, much different than me. But I really struggle to see people or to want to help people or to want to zoom in on the needs of people that I've had a bad experience with in the past. People who've hurt me, people who've talked bad about me, people who've lied about me, people who've gossiped about me, people who have wounded me or my family, people I love. People that have just lied to me. It's, it's hard to want to zoom in and help them, right? And we've all had bad experiences with people. We've all had bad experiences with someone. And it makes us not want to help them. And truly, it makes us not even want to see them anymore. But if I'm going to be like Jesus, and if I want to live up to my call in Christ, and if I want to walk this worthy walk that Paul talks about, I have to not let this, I have to not let these bad experiences or these past experiences become an obstacle that keeps me from seeing people the way God wants me to see them. I really do believe that our past experiences are great obstacles for us when it comes to zooming in and being ready to love and to minister and to see people the way God sees people. Some of you are thinking of somebody right now in your life that you don't see anymore. I mean, you see them. You might work with them. You might see them every day. You might live with them. You might see them every day. But you don't really see them. You don't really see their needs. You don't really see their wants. You don't really see their desires. You don't really see them because of your past experiences. Do y'all see how this could be an obstacle? If you see how that could be an obstacle, can you just say, Lord, help me to see? Yeah. As you think about that person, I just want you to say, Lord, help me to see. Here's the second one. Expectations. 
By a show of hands right now, how many of you feel like there's some expectations on your life? Better be everybody. Because there's all kinds of expectations on us, aren't there? Expectations are everywhere. There are, we, we have personal expectations for ourselves. There are professional expectations from our company, our boss. Our employees have expectations of us. If we're a supervisor or maybe we're the boss or the owner, right? Our employees expect us to do things, namely pay them on Friday. But many other things, too, come with those responsibilities. There are marital expectations. There are parental expectations. Um, if you live in a community, which all of you do, there are civic expectations. Y'all are in church. There are religious expectations. There are financial expectations weighing on you right now. Even your pets have expectations of you, don't they? We, we have three dogs. We have this little one. She's old. Her name's Chrissy. And Chrissy, oh my goodness, y'all, this little diva, she is. I ain't lying or exaggerating this. Every morning... 5.30, 5.45, sometimes closer to 6, but usually between 5.30 and 5.45, she expects somebody to get up and let her out the door. And, and she expects it. She will come to uh, the room I sleep in, which is also where Abby sleeps, and she will stand at the door and she will bark until Abby gets up and lets her out. She expects Abby to get up and let her out. She knows I ain't going to do it. <laughs> I'm a heavy sleeper. But here's the worst part. Abby will get up and she'll go let the dog out. And then Abby will shut the door, lock the door, come back, get back in bed, and try to go back to sleep, catch another 15-minute little nap. And Chrissy will go do her thing and in about 30 seconds, she'll be back at the back door barking, expecting somebody to let her back in. Unless, of course, you stand at the door, and then she's going to just mingle around out there for 20 minutes so you don't get your little nap back in. She's a little diva with expectations. They expect you to feed them. They expect you to clean up after them. They expect you to cuddle with them and love on them. Yeah, I'm talking about your kids. They expect these things <laughs> out of you and your pets. There's expectation. If there's one thing none of us can escape from, it's expectations. And many times, it's the great expectations that are placed on our lives and the great expectation of trying to, to meet everybody's needs that keeps us from having the capacity or the desire to want to zoom in and see people and their problems the way God sees them. We just can't do it because we're so busy trying to fulfill all the expectations that have been placed on us we just don't have any more capacity for it. Look at verse 40, our, the very first verse of our text. It says, When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all what? They were all expecting him. They were expecting him, y'all. If you think you have a lot of expectations on your life, if you think you have a lot of people expecting things from you, Imagine how Jesus must have felt. Imagine how this must have been for Jesus. To show up with this crowd of people all expecting him to do something for them. Expecting him to provide something for them. Expecting him to give them something so they could get something from him. They weren't just expecting him to show up so they could snap a selfie with him. No, they were expecting him to do something for them. Verse 42 says, while he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. This is a mob of people that are pressing in on Jesus because they all have expect expectations of Jesus. I bet at some point in your life, maybe even right now, you have felt like, 
all the expectations of the world were crushing in on you. Have you ever felt that way? It's a horrible feeling. And Jesus had to have felt that way too. I mean, it's happening to him. They're literally crushing him. And here's the problem with these expectations. When we feel overwhelmed with expectations, when we feel crushed by the expectations of the world or our job or our career or our kids or our pets or the combination of all of it, when we get crushed by expectations, our reaction is never to zoom in, to focus, or to look for ways to help somebody else. Our reaction is never to see people. Our reaction is to run, to hide, to escape, to avoid and evade everybody we possibly can. And I really, truly, church, I believe it. I believe the devil loves it when we get so focused and become so fearful of all the expectations in our life. He loves it when we become fearful and focused on all the expectations because he knows That when we are fearful of and focused on the expectations that are threatening to crush us, we are going to struggle with the two things God has called us to do, which is love God and love people. Those are the first things to go when we're being crushed. When we're overwhelmed by expectations, those are the first things we let go of. See, expectations are a major obstacle when it comes to you and I being able to see people the way Jesus saw people. That's why we have to say, Lord, even despite all these expectations, help me to see. The proclamation is Jesus saw. We know he was able to get past these things. The prayer is help me to see. So we can see how past experiences would affect us. We can see how the present expectations on our life would would, would affect us. But let me give you the third one. The perceived emergencies of life get in our way as well. In, in, In our text, Jesus is not just facing the obstacle of experiences with Jairus. He's not just facing the obstacle of all the expectations of the crowd that we've just discussed. He's responding to an emergency. He's in the middle of of being on his way, moving in the direction of a true crisis. He's on his way to help a little girl that's dying. I mean, this is about as big as it gets. This is a big deal. This is about as big of an emergency as you can have. You have to keep in mind, church, there's no Air Life helicopter coming to help this girl. They're not going to whisk her away to some medical trauma unit in another city and be able to save her life. Jesus doesn't have a private helicopter to get him from where he is to where he needs to be to help her. This is going to take some time. He's got to travel there on foot. He's got a crowd pressing around him. Like they're, they're moving, they're inching their way that way, but he's got to get there. This is the only shot she has. So every second counts, every moment is precious. You have to know Jarius must have been so relieved when Jesus said, okay, I'll do it. And he started moving that direction. But then in the midst of responding to one crisis... He stops. Verse 45, who touched me? Who touched me, Jesus asked. And they all denied it. Everybody said, nobody nobody touched you. And Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. Everybody's touching you. (laughs) They're all liars. (laughs) And Jesus, he says, no, somebody touched me. Who touched me? He says, I know that power has gone out from me. Now keep in mind, if you're Jarius, if you're this little girl's daddy, you'd be thinking, who cares? Why are you stopping? Come on, let's go. 
I don't care if some of your power went out. I need your power at my house right now. His expectations are present and pressing. And I promise you that his face said, get moving. This is an emergency. But Jesus stops and he's having a conversation. And he begins this interaction with this woman. And we don't know how long it took, but I can tell you it took too long if you're Jairus. I can also tell you as soon as this is over, somebody shows up from Jairus' house and says, Hey, don't bother the good teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. How devastating would that have been to him? Now, Jesus ends up fixing that. That's for another day. But, gosh, this dad, he's like, come on, let's go. But look what it says in 47. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him in the presence of all the people. She declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. And then it says this in verse 48. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Several interesting things here, several points. He's having this interaction, this one-on-one moment in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of an emergency. In the Greek text, it says that she perceived that she could not escape from being noticed. In other words, after this, as this interaction is happening, she basically goes, he knows it was me. Because of course he does. He's the son of God. She hasn't put all that together quite, but But she's just like, I'm not going to get away with this. She perceived that she was not going to be able to leave or escape without being noticed. So you have to understand, this woman doesn't step forward in faith to acknowledge that she's the one who touched Jesus. She really steps forward in fear. That's why it says she was trembling. She came trembling. And fell down before him. She doesn't know what's going to happen. She had her own expectations. She had her own emergency. And she pressed in. Slipped up from behind him. Pressed through the crowd. Reached out. Touched the hem of his garment. And was healed. She had her own experience with Jesus. It was a good one. But now she is scared because she can't escape. She didn't want to be noticed. She just wanted to slip away. And there's real significance in the fact that Jesus took the time in the middle of this emergency, in the middle of this other crisis, he interrupted all of that to speak to this woman. And I've been thinking about this and pondering this, and I'm like, you know, why would Jesus stop? What was so important about this interaction? Why did he have to do this? It wasn't just to exceed her expectations. It wasn't so he could snap a selfie or sign an autograph for her. No, Jesus, he he just sees her, and he sees her in the totality of what she's going through. And he says, I'm not just going to fix you physically. We're going to fix more than that. He fixes three things for her. He restores three things for her. And he has to have this interaction for her, with her, for all of this to be unveiled. The first one is the easiest one. He, he fixed her physically. He fixes her problem. There's a miracle that takes place in her physical body. Instantly when she touches the hem of his robe, the power leaves him. She's healed. That's awesome, right? There's a physical restoration in her life. But there's also a restoration of her socially. There's a, he restored her to a proper social status. You see, her condition would have made her as a woman unclean. She's an outcast in society. And by taking the time to see her, and by taking the time to stop, and by taking the time to publicly announce and address the entire crowd and say, you're, you're healed, he was also saying, you're clean. You can come back into society. You're not dirty anymore. He restored her to society. And then he restored her into something she was not expecting. He restored her spiritually. He restored her relationship between her and her father in heaven. 
In the text, Jesus calls her daughter. Did you notice that? If you've got your Bibles open, I would encourage you to underline that, circle that, put a square around that, star by it, highlight it, whatever. He calls her daughter. This is the only time in the Gospels Jesus uses this word to address a woman. It's a very loving and affectionate word. It's a word a father would use to call his daughter his daughter. If there was any doubt about the loving nature of this one-on-one interaction that Jesus is having with this woman, it all gets put to rest when he uses that one word. He calls her the most affectionate word possible. He labels her in the most affectionate way he can by calling her daughter. He says, I see you. And isn't it amazing that this just so happens to take place as he's going to save the daughter of someone else. So the crowd can see that he sees not just the daughter of Jairus, but he sees this lady as his daughter. Daughter. Only time he says it to a woman in the Gospels. Daughter. And then he says this. He says, your faith has not healed you, He says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And that's very specific. Again, in the Greek, this is a word that is only used for salvation. It's a spiritual restoration. He's saying your sins are forgiven. You're right with the Lord. We see him use it again in Luke 7, verse 50, whenever he's talking with the woman who anoints his feet with oil. He uses the same thing, and there's a whole other set of expectations there. She's not approaching him in some great emergency, but, but even there we see Jesus say it the same way, your faith has saved you. There's a spiritual restoration that takes place. So Jesus restores her health, he restores her to society, and he restores her spiritually in this one-on-one interaction. That's why he stopped. All of that had to be done. And he did it all while he was responding to a very real emergency and crisis. Now, I know we all have emergencies in our life, and I know we all have crises. But the problem is, is we build everything up into a crisis. We build everything up into an emergency. I had a whole list of things I saw on social media last week where people were just freaking out and uh, if, if I showed them to you, you would be like, that's not a crisis, but they're acting like it is, right? Because this is what we do in our society. I'm not going to show them because I don't want to embarrass anybody. And, you know, some of y'all will go, oh, that's my post. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but if you don't believe me, go on social media and just look on your feed and look at the things people make a big deal out of. Some people were losing their minds yesterday because their team lost a football game. Like, they they were in complete breakdown mode. Right? I mean, it's total crisis. You, You cannot imagine. We make everything into a crisis. And when we do that, we get into this position where we don't see anybody because we're just running from crisis to crisis to crisis. And when you're in a crisis, when you're in an emergency, it's so easy to get so tunnel visioned, you don't see anything else. We become so focused and fixated on the task or the trial or the tribulation or the circumstance, even if we've invented it ourselves, we become so focused on it, we see nothing else. And that's why we have to say, Lord, help me to see. Even in the middle of a real crisis, Lord, help me to see. Because if we don't, we won't see the people that we bump into in our path, the people that press in on us. We won't see them. Either because of a past experience or a present expectation or a perceived emergency in our life. These are the three biggest obstacles for you and me in really seeing people the way Jesus saw people. So you might be wondering, well, How do I get past it? How do I get past seeing people the way I see them today? How do I I really see people the way Jesus wants me to see people? 
How do I get past seeing somebody I've had a bad past experience with? Or how do I get past seeing people when there's so many expectations on my own life that I'm trying to meet on a weekly basis? Or how do I get past, you know, being able to see people while I'm dealing with a real emergency in my own life right now? Honestly, I've been rolling that around in my heart and mind all week long. And you know what? I just keep coming back to the plea. I think we just have to pray, Lord, help me to see. Because the only way we're really going to see people the way God sees people is if God gives us the power to do it. This isn't something we can do on our own. It's not something we can do by memorizing a verse or shaking a magic stick over it. We're going to have to pray about it. And so I'm going to give you a challenge, and I hope you'll take it. Here's the challenge for this week. I want to challenge you this week to make that your prayer. Every day, everywhere, every moment, every time you think about anything, every time you see somebody, just whisper that to yourself. Lord, help me to see. Help me to see them the way you see them. Even if you're in the middle of an emergency, Lord, help me to see. Even if you're facing somebody you've had a bad past experience with, Lord, help me to see. Even if you wake up in the morning and you're thinking about your to-do list and all the expectations, make your prayer, Lord, help me to see. As we close today, let me say this. If you're here today and you feel like nobody sees you, you're one of those who feels like nobody cares, nobody loves you, nobody sees you, I can promise you Jesus does. Jesus sees you. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares about you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows every thought in your heart. He knows every dream you've ever dreamt. He knows you better than you know yourself. He sees you. And he doesn't see you in a mass of humanity. He sees you in a one-on-one way, just like Jarius and this woman. He sees you. I want you to know he sees you. I want you to know he died for you. I want you to know he loves you. And I want you to know he will save you just like he did this woman. If you will repent of your sins, if you will confess that he is Lord, if you will acknowledge that he sees you this day, you will be saved. You might come forth just like she did in fear and trembling, but I pray you would come to Jesus. Let's pray. If that's you, and you know that Jesus sees you and you're ready to be saved, we invite you to pray. Just say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray, and so I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new. I ask that you would forgive me. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for seeing me and loving me. Father, as we come before you this hour, we humbly confess we need your help. We need your help to see, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would give us the spiritual binoculars we need to see clearly, to take things that are far away and bring them in close so we can see them clearly. Lord, to take all the chaos that surrounds us and to focus it in and get away from the distraction and just to see what you need us to see as we approach people, one-on-one, day after day, minute after minute, moment after moment. Lord, help us to see. And Lord, I know that there are obstacles to that. These bad experiences, these past experiences, Lord, all the expectations of our life, all these emergencies that we face and these crises that come our way, Lord. But Lord, even in the midst of all of that, help us to see. Not so we can become YouTube famous or TikTok famous, Lord, but so we can impact the world. 
Help us never to forget the power of impacting one person's life. Help us to see. Father, this is our prayer. Help us to see. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.